many people need to die before we listen to the facts? One, ten, one hundred? Let's take a look, for example, to the appearance of HIV AIDS in the US. By 1983, we knew of the spread of the disease through various channels, for example, blood transfusions. So how many people need to die before we listen to those facts? The answer? 5,000. At least 5,000 people died in the three years that it took to implement the scientific recommendations that experts had called for. Scientific facts alone don't change the world, especially in complex situations like this one. There could be other reasons. There could be implementation reasons, economic reasons, political reasons, strategic reasons. Science is an important part, but it's only part of the equation. And definitely, it's not only about pushing the facts and publishing the facts. Science should be engaged in the way we make decisions. But don't get me wrong, I'm a scientist. I love science. I'm a whole package scientist with extras. I did physics degrees and the PhD and the, the postdoc. I really think science is one of the most beautiful things we have created to understand, to understand nature, understand the world. But if science is, is about everything, how many of you, when you're on TV and you see this documentary about nature, about the zebras in Africa, instead of thinking how amazing it is that we understand what's happening there, you think it's a good one for a little nap. Or I'm not in the mood, I'm stressed. You change the channel, you flip the page. What's happening here? Why are so disconnected? We are supposed to be a beautiful thing to understand. What's happening here, I think, to understand what's happening, we need to go back a little bit. Back when scientists were natural philosophers. Think of the old scientists like Gauss or Newton. They were astronomers and geologists and mathematicians. And, 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 and. They were people of the world. But as science evolved, it went deeper and deeper into specializations. But as science evolved, it went deeper and deeper into the fields that needed more specialization. We started to constrict science into silos, silos of knowledge, segmenting reality. So scientists started to be astronomers or geologists or mathematicians, and they started to engage only in their own silo, with their own peers, not with other silos, or with society in general. And somehow, we were okay with that. And then on top of that, as a scientist, your credentials, your funding, your job, depends on publications and the citations of those publications. If you're a scientist, you're probably nodding now. But I think there is a strong case to make that scientists are not so because of the facts in their head, but because of the way they look at the world and how they understand. So if the expectation is to understand everything, you only have time to do what ends up in a paper. And that's the reason I left research. That's the reason I left back then my dream job of rocket scientist for a six months fellowship with, with no employment prospects afterwards. Because as, as much as I loved it, I felt frustrated. There is so much more in science than, than publishing, right? And we need science not because of the facts, but because it helps you, it helps us, all of us, move forward, understand what's happening, what explains those facts, that data, not because of the things we have in our head, the, the numbers. And in this world that depends more and more on technology, that depends more and more in science, there is less and less people that understand those things. And then the hypothesis I had is, let's see what happens. What happens if a scientist that is a researcher stops being a researcher and keeps being a scientist? And then I started to look for places to apply the tools I learned, the mathematics, because in the end, 
turns out that the waves in the sun, the plasma waves, the physics to understand that is similar to the traffic patterns in the cities. So that's what I'm doing at the World Bank. At the World Bank, do we do projects. I want to share with you three examples. This is the first example. That this is Derhi, it's a little village in India. And if you were there, you will see the transformers, you will see the lights, because electrification is very important in development. Not only provides more safety and more better jobs, but also allows kids, for example, to do their homework after sunset. So electrification, having lights, is very important. But if you were in Derhi at night, you wouldn't see anything, because there is no current in those cables. Because of generation and transmission, it's a very complicated problem. So what we did there is that why don't we use the satellites that go every night and take pictures at night of the whole of the country? And then a process that is rather complicated to remove the clouds, take into account the moon shining, all these things, but conceptually it's very simple. Is Can we ask in this image how much light there is on every single village? And there are a lot of villages in India. There are more than 100,000 of villages in India. The actual number we don't really know, but because we are trying to get the data. But the point is that if we are able to ask the questions of how much light there is in every village every night, we can understand not only where there is light or not, when there are blackouts or not, but because these satellites have been doing this for the last 15 years, we can also know how effective we were doing this. And now we can start to implement the programs that use our resources the best, so that kids like this one can do their, his homework after sunset with artificial lights. The second project I want to share is in China, in a very rural province in China. And if you live here, one of the problems you have is accessibility. Or in other words, if you're a farmer, how do you go to the market to sell your product? Or if you are e sick, how do you go to the hospital? or the kids to school. It takes a lot of time. Why? Because often the roads are like this one. The roads are muddy and takes a lot of time. So why don't we make it better? The typically, the measure of accessibility for everyone is the percentage of roads that are all weather roads, so you can use them. And we can push it more. We can make it about the people. We can make it about how much time it gets you from this village on you or from that village to get to the closest, whichever it is, hospital. So the complexity of the problem becomes simple in a map. If you live in the province that you have as green, it means that you are going to reach the hospital in less than one hour. If you live in the red parts, it means it takes a lot of time. So we need to make the red parts of the country become greener. And then figure out what are the roads that if you change them, improves this number. So we can be much better, push ourselves to understand the complexity of what's happening. The third example I want to share with you is traffic. How many of you have been stuck in traffic in the cities? Probably everyone. Well, in developing countries, it's much worse. Not only the roads are not prepared for the number of cars we see, but also maintenance is, a, is an issue the cables, the traffic lights, the signals. And in practice, what happens is that you have people taking calls all the time from his colleagues, writing down reports of what the traffic is and what is the traffic flows. And there are literally pages and pages with this information. We can do better than this. So in this case, our hypothesis is why don't we use these apps you can call on your phone to call for a taxi. Because every driver in the city has the app running and is sending the location of all the cars on the fleet every few seconds. If you put that in a, in a map, you have a live picture of the phones is moving, is moving slowly across the city. So you get the information of the traffic and how much time they stop in the, in the intersection or in the traffic lights. And then you can know how to tweak those traffic lights in response to the live information of traffic, which is going to make everyone happy, including, next slide, Eric, which now has a tool that allows him to know much more without having to build any infrastructure. 
that's why I think the features in our data is how we absorb complexity. Because we've never had as much data as we have today. It's growing exponentially. You probably heard of it. Or in other words, most of the data we have today has been generated in the last two years. And we have never had as many people looking at that data. So the opportunity to make data-driven decisions is unprecedented. So what are we going to do with this? I don't think that more data, just more data, is going to solve our biggest problems or most personal ones. Think about the environmental crisis. Think about immigration, migration and refugees. Think about the economic crisis. Or think about your personal projects or professional ones. Or if you get diagnosed with an illness, a complicated one. When someone comes to you with data, when an expert comes to you with data, especially is an expert, if someone comes to ask for your vote, especially if they want to ask for your vote, be very unapologetic to ask questions, to try to understand. Because understanding is one of the most empowering tools we have. And science is a way to try and understand. There are tools. It gives you tools to understand. You still have your culture, your education, your personality, your feelings, everything. But then you also have this tool to allow you to absorb what it means while you're seeing the facts that you have around you. So it gives you visibility of what are the options on the table and the consequences of choosing one or other option. And it gives you the empowerment to take the steps to do what you need to do with the information you had and knowing that is the right answer for what you knew then. In a word, I really think that we need to recall science as a way at looking at the world versus a body of knowledge. Thank you. <laughs>